Welcome to this evening's Digital Glaucoma Support Group. Um, it's lovely that you've all used your evening to come and uh, listen to hear all about a parent's guide to childhood glaucoma. Um, it's lovely to have you all joining us. My name is Joanna Bradley and I'm Head of Support Services at Glaucoma UK. I'm delighted to welcome our speaker, Mr. Joe Abbott. Joe is a consultant paediatric ophthalmic surgeon and lead for glaucoma since 2012 at Birmingham Children's Hospital. He's one of very few surgeons internationally with fellowships in paediatric ophthalmology and glaucoma. So he really knows what he's talking about. And there's no better person to be here talking to us this evening. We're delighted he's joining us today to deliver a talk titled Childhood Glaucomas, A Parent's Guide. We really hope it will help all of you understand better what childhood glaucomas are, what treatment children might receive at different stages, and what help and support might be available. I'm so glad so many of you have chosen to spend your evening with us. So a little bit about Glaucoma UK. Glaucoma UK is the UK's charity for people with glaucoma. We work in three main areas to prevent glaucoma sight loss. Firstly, we campaign to raise awareness of the disease. We want people to know what glaucoma is and about the importance of getting your eyes tested. The earlier glaucoma is diagnosed, the less likely people are to experience sight loss. Secondly, we provide support and advice to people with glaucoma and those who care for them. We have information leaflets, a helpline, a buddy service and a patient forum and we provide training and advice to professionals looking after people with glaucoma. All of our services are free. Finally, we fund research into the diagnosis, treatment, care and prevention of glaucoma. It's not a huge amount of money, but we often provide initial funding for seed research that gets early stage research going. So now I'm going to hand over to our speaker, Joe. Please don't forget to post questions in the Q&A so we can have a nice interactive session. Um, but now, Joe, over to you. Great. So uh, let me add my um, thanks to you for joining us this evening. I hope you find the the next um, 40 minutes or so helpful. Um, we're very much open to your questions and there's very deliberately plenty of time for questions at the end of my short presentation. Um, and the idea of my talk is that um, it just sort of is a broad overview about what glaucoma is and what to expect um, if you have a child who has glaucoma. And this is deliberately thinking about um, younger children um, rather than teenagers, but we can cover that too if there are questions about that. I presume you can see my slide okay, is that is that right, Joanna? Uh, yes, you can. Great, okay. So um, what is glaucoma? Um, the glaucoma is a problem to, essentially to do with pressure inside the eye um, and from a very simplistic point of view, the eye is a sealed cavity. And if the pressure in it is too high, um, there's nowhere easy for the fluid to go. And the nerve at the back of the eye, the yellow structure on the right hand side of your screen um, is susceptible to higher pressures and gets damaged. And like many nerves in the body, if the nerve is damaged, it can't grow back. So it's all about preventing damage to that nerve. And the chamber at the front of the eye on the left hand side of your screen is where the pressure comes from because there's an equilibrium with fluid going into your eye and fluid coming out of your eye. So there's pressure here in this chamber and the reason for the pressure is a problem to do with the passage of fluid it usually is produced at the back of the eye where my pointer is and goes through little fibres that suspend the lens into this chamber at the front of the eye called the anterior chamber and drains out into the drainage angle. And usually, although not always, the problem is to do with some sort of obstruction to fluid getting out of the eye and the pressure goes up. Um, and that leads to changes in this structure, the nerve at the back of the eye. Um, I suspect some of the audience will be expert or semi-expert already and will be familiar with pictures of the nerve at the back of the eye. And this is a sort of this is a healthy looking nerve. And after pressure, um, the, the changes in the nerve uh, make the middle bit paler, which is called the cup within the disc. Um, and this rim of sort of orangey yellow nerve material, which it pretty much fills that 
cut, uh, it starts to become limited to the outside. And that is physically the, the layer which is carrying the vision information from the retina to the brain and represents damage. Um, so glaucoma has a definition which is quite useful. Pediatric glaucoma has a definition, um, which is that if you have two or more of these five criteria, um, it can be formally called glaucoma. Um, and you might see this bounded about MMHG means millimeters of mercury and is a measure of units of pressure. So um, we'll talk a bit more about this in a minute, but crudely, um, a pressure up to about 21 is normal. And for the purposes of diagnosis, um, greater than 21 um, is a diagnosis of glaucoma, or if there are changes, this cupping of the nerve that we were talking about a moment ago. And this, these other factors, the next two, are something specific to younger children with glaucoma, that because the eye is stretchy when we're young, the cornea can get bigger, and it can also have these changes in them called, in it called a harb striae, which is um, a split within one of the layers of the cornea, or it can go cloudy, um, which is edema, or it can get bigger in diameter. And similarly, if your eye gets bigger, you become more short-sighted. And this is something that, again, particularly happens in children more than adults, and particularly in young children. And the fifth criteria is if there's a visual field defect. So this means a problem um, being able to see to the sides when looking straight ahead. And um, I'm sorry, the, there are various animations on these slides, but um, the point is probably easier to make without things whizzing about anyway. But visual fields are easier to measure in children who are um, about eight years old and older. Different children are different, but um, they can, uh, it, obviously it's very difficult to measure that in a, in a young baby. Um, and measuring the pressure is um, something, I wonder if I just try this for a second. Do you have the slide now, Joanna, that says measuring the pressure on it? Yes, I do. Yeah, so you can see on the right-hand side of the screen, um, this is a super high magnification of the pressure device measuring um, the pressure in the cornea. So um, this is something called an eye care tonometer or a rebound tonometer. Um, and these things have absolutely transformed care for children with glaucoma because they um, can very often um, be successful at measuring the pressure or getting a good idea of it in the clinic without needing an anaesthetic. So in Birmingham, where I'm based, we found that the number of times in a year that we needed an EUA, an examination under anaesthetic, was dramatically reduced with the introduction about 10 years ago now of these rebound tonometers. And some families occasionally have these at home, um, and they, they are uh, brilliant devices, really. So a bit more about the optic nerve. Um, this is the picture I showed you earlier. There are devices which can image across the optic nerve. So the picture on your left, uh, where my arrow is, is a cross section of the orange picture on the right. And it enables us to be able to quantify and to measure uh, what the nerve looks like. And so you, your doctor might describe this, called, this is an OCT. Um, an OCT is uh, a increasingly and already a very good tool for measuring optic nerve changes, particularly in older children. Um, and we've been collaborating with Lester in using a handheld device, which is useful for younger children. Uh, most of the devices and the technology originated with a big heavy camera that was sat on a desk and you had to put your chin on a chin rest to use it. And they're still brilliant for older kids and adults, but not so much young children. And we know that in, um, in young children, um, the nerve from the OCT changes in a slightly different way to adults. And you get this deeper cupping. Um, it seems to be a particular characteristic of, um, of young children. So um, that's all work done by a team in Leicester. So, what does glaucoma look like in children? Um, well, it looks different to adults in a nutshell, and parents will very often know um, or have a good idea about whether pressure is under good control because of the presence or absence or changing of some of these features. So the picture here is an example of quite bad glaucoma, um, and you can see how the corneas, the clear bit on the front of your eye has gone cloudy. Um, 
often, not always, um, ch children will have watery eyes, photophobia, sensitivity to light, and the eyes might look particularly big. Um, or sometimes um, children with brown eyes are described as having blue, a bluish appearance to their eyes. Um, so um, what's a normal pressure for my child? So this is a, these are questions that I hoped would be useful for, for you as an audience. And this might help to understand the variability of pressure. So this little video is one of, he was a trainee and is now a consultant um, in Birmingham, AJ Gowrie, who kindly did this. So I've just measured his pressure with that rebound tonometer. His pressure's 13, one, three. And if he holds his breath, sorry about the slightly amdram way of holding his breath. <laughs> um, you can see that the pressure immediately is much higher and now measures 30, three, zero. So this is really important because it just, it says that the way in which pressures are measured um, is absolutely crucial. And um, so children like the rest of us um, are, if they're nervous when they're being approached with an instrument, even if they're trying their best to cooperate, may well hold their breath through effort of doing it or nervousness. And that can artificially affect pressure. And there are a whole myriad of different reasons. That's one of the common reasons, um, but there are a whole, range of different reasons why the pressure can sometimes read falsely high um, and a few reasons why it can read falsely low as well. So this next slide is a bit technical for which I apologize but it shows the, the this is what happens this this um, this line here where my arrow is is reflecting what happens to the eye pressure in when a child has an anesthetic if their carbon dioxide levels go up. So the carbon dioxide puts your pressure up. And this next graph shows what happens under anaesthetic if you've had either ketamine, which is this top line, it doesn't affect the pressure so much, or if you have an in inhaled anaesthetic, a very common one, sevoflurane, over two minutes, certainly four minutes, can affect the pressure quite significantly. So context is really important, and I, that's my key message, I suppose, is that the numerical value alone of the pressure um, is not the full story about whether the glaucoma is controlled. So next question I thought we, I'd address is, how did my child get glaucoma? And that really depends on what the, the, the mechanism of the glaucoma, and, and those that can vary. Um, this is a brilliant survey done by Professor Kaur and Maria Papadopoulos who are based in London, Maria's retired recently, and um, reflects the, you know, this was a survey of the UK different causes of glaucoma in children. Um, and this will vary from one part of the world to another, but a big chunk, the majority, the biggest group, not quite the majority, but the biggest group of primary congenital glaucoma. So this is a genetic cause for glaucoma. And I'll talk a bit more about that in a second. And then another big group are the lens-related glaucomas. So this is if a child has been born with a cataract or acquired a cataract, um, usually the former, and then gone on to have a problem with pressure as a side effect of having their lens, cloudy lens, quite appropriately operated on. Another big group are children who have something called sturge weber syndrome related to a birthmark of the skin. Um, and inflammation in the eye is another group. So it depends why the glaucoma has happened as to how the child um, got the glaucoma in the first place. So um, certain things follow certain inheritance patterns and some are not inheritable at all. Um, so primary congenital glaucoma is usually what's called uh, a recessive mechanism of inheritance, but not always. And, um, and that means if mum and dad both have the gene, um, then one in four of their children by, by maths, but not reality necessarily, because each time you throw in, a duck, throw in the dice, um, you might have a, a child who is affected by glaucoma. And that risk is commoner if mum and dad are um, related to each other. O other eye problems, like if the, I mentioned, children who are born with or get cataracts very soon after birth, particularly children who are born with cataracts, 
very often have what's called autosomal dominant inheritance, meaning that one in two of an affected parent will be affected by the, by the condition. Um, and th these are kind of a bit old fashioned, these two slides that I've shown, because genetic understanding of um, eye disease is moving at such a fast rate that often a much more accurate answer can be can be arrived at through looking in a looking in blood or usually blood for the gene um, that's caused a child's glaucoma, um, and that can help to predict, um, you know, whether future generations will be affected, and not yet affecting treatment directly, but already affecting our understanding of how bad disease can be. Um, uh, so things are moving fast there. Parents often very sensibly ask, what can we do at home to make our child better? Um, and this question often comes from parents who are faced with the diagnosis for the first time and are wondering about lifestyle things like um, exercise, diet. Um, and although those play a part to a degree in particularly in adult glaucoma, um, their role in certainly infantile and childhood glaucomas is less, a lot less. But there's still lots that parents can do. Um, this top one I've written, emotional support, which sounds so easy when you just <laughs> write it down, but it, it becomes so important for older children into their teenage years, younger children to cope with the experience of coming to hospital on an usually or sometimes a lot of different occasions. Um, meticulous attention to appointments and drops, again easily said, much harder to do. Um, but the families who, who manage to do these things well, and I'm always in awe of them, um, but the families that do these things well, um, they, I have to say that you do notice, I notice that those children do better with their glaucoma. So there is lots that can be done. Um, following surgery, there are instructions which can help to, if they're stuck to, can help to avoid nasty problems like infection, which fortunately is very rare. Um, and one of the, again, not easy to do, and some families are amazing at it, um, is to approach the problem, particularly in, in the presence of the child, in as positive a way as possible. And they'll role play in the clinic and allow their eyes to be looked at um, and have practiced at home before coming in um, and worked to make the experience for the child as, as positive as possible. And there's lots more besides, but those are just a few things. Uh, I, I suspect there are members in the audience who can um, who have a lot of wisdom to share around what can be done under that heading. Um, so what can be done under this heading meaning, uh, is meaning what can be done um, medically about the glaucoma. And it really falls, the answer to that falls under one of four headings really. Um, so there is a, there's a small uh, picture of surgery on this next uh, slide. Um, and so if, I hope that's okay with the audience. If you think that that is not for you, then perhaps um, turn away for a few minutes. Um, but the, there are four different kind of outcomes, I think, for each appointment that you come to largely. Um, either things will be under control and it will be a case of just watching and keeping an eye on things. Secondly, there might be solutions which are controlling the situation from medications, which are largely drops, sometimes oral um, treatment by mouth. Um, and there are a whole bewildering range of different eye drops that each, each preparation has a drug name and a brand name. Um, and some of them have a combination, which are particularly good for children, where you have a cocktail, two drugs in the same bottle. Um, and it means that it reduces the stress and trauma of having to put drops in because they're less frequent. Um, thirdly, the option of surgery. So this talk is not really about surgery, but very broadly, um, sometimes we can open up the natural pathway for fluid out of the eye. And there's been a resurgence of different techniques for doing this in the last 10 years or so. Um, and these come under the heading of angle surgery. 
Um, and there are new pathways. There are, this, the other heading is different and new ways for pathways for fluid, for fluid to get out of the eye. And the traditional two, and really still the go-to options in children, are trabeculectomy and tube surgery. Um, though there are newer innovations, particularly in adult glaucoma, um, but we tend generally to wait until a technology is tried and tested um, before it comes across into children's eyes, partly because children's eyes are more difficult to operate on for different reasons. Um, and secondly, because obviously the surgery has to work for a long, long time. And the last smaller category is that particularly for young children, there'll be glasses and patching sometimes to get the best out of the vision um, that the nerve and the eye can convey to a child's brain. Um, so what support is available? Um, so this, I thought this might be interesting for this audience to see that uh, Professor Pete Shah and I and some collaborators worked on something called a children's glaucoma passport um, about 10 years ago. I, nearly all of my patients have these. Um, and the idea is that it's a document that can help travel with you as a family and your child, particularly if you're going between different eye doctors. So that might well be the way that um, care is, is provided, that you'll go to a more distant centre for surgery, um, but a more local centre will be able to provide monitoring. So it's useful to have a document that travels with you and moves faster than letters move around the NHS. And just a quick look through this, um, if we just flick through the pages. And um, so really important information as a family, it's absolutely crucial that you have emergency contact numbers and you have reliable contact numbers for, for your surgeon and their, whoever in my service, the sec my secretary Fiona Flynn is fantastic. Um, but sometimes a phone number might be, for access might be the eye clinic or an emergency contact number, um, particularly if you're having problems in the immediate aftermath of an operation. Excuse me. Other things uh, within this book um, are tips about how to put drops in. Um, and I'm grateful to the families who helped put this together. Um, and this is another way of putting drops in um, for sort of toddler age children. Um, some frequently asked questions, how to survive a, an eye clinic, um, a survival bag, tips and hints. Um, we need to just update, actually, I noticed looking at this this evening, the IGA bit, but the, these are a range of useful contacts and sources of advice and support. Um, so another important source of advice, coming to the end of my talk now, is the ECLO, the Eye Clinic Liaison Officer. So the truth is that in different parts of the country um, and even different parts of a city, the, the people who can be a helpful um, source of advice um, can vary. And an ECLO is, an eye, is somebody who you, has good levels of understanding of the local in, you know, environment, support environment, and they can help with um, accessing benefits, emotional support, um, employment advice. Um, and that can be important for children as they get into their teenage years, particularly about the, uh, the visual field and the visual acuity level can help to determine, well, uh, you know, the, the most appropriate career choices going forward. Not every clinic have the, has an eye clinic liaison officer and the Department of Health says that it's good practice to have one, but as a profession, we're fighting to get the an eye clinic liaison officer in every clinic. And there are sources of good advice out there, Glaucoma UK um, being one of, amongst them and Glaucoma UK um, very kindly fund those um, glaucoma passports through a, through a, a charity bid. Um, and large hospitals like Moorfields, Bascom Palmer in America have good websites with good information. And there are professional bodies on the screen which also have a patient um, and it's a uh, patient um, information, which is good. Um, and I thought I'd just, last bit really is um, what to expect after an operation and what to look out for. 
I put this in because of the importance of the rare occasion when families don't know what to look out for and mishaps occur or they can't get a hold of professionals. Again, the next slide has a picture of an eye um, having at the end of surgery so that you know what it might look like. Um, so um, I hope that's okay. Um, but the eye can look a bit red. This is immediately at the end of a tube operation, still in theatre. Um, and sometimes the eye can look a lot more red than this. The redness doesn't always correlate to the degree of inflammation and pain. Um, but it's an important thing to monitor for after an operation. Things to expect, unfortunately, often more drops. Um, after a tube operation, I quite often give some oral um, strong pain relief, like an opiate short relief, short term course of opiate pain relief. And that can be quite helpful for some families. Most operations need about a week off school, but ask your surgeon. And it, depending on the operation, there'll be some kind of eye protection and activities to avoid um, for a period after the surgery. And this is the important slide, really, this sort of triangle of things to look out for. So if, an, if your eyes get more painful, more red, or the vision worse, then that's bad news, unless you've had your eye looked at and it's been said that things are okay for other reasons. But the, really the reason these three things can come together is if there's an infection. An infection, bad news, and the sooner it's caught, the better. Um, and to a degree after an operation, there will be some soreness, some redness, and some often some blurriness of the vision. Um, and often those things will be on an improving trajectory, but as if they're getting worse, that, that you should contact your contact numbers. And I just thought on a slightly more optimistic note that I'd show a few, two slides that show what happens after a tube operation, because it's a big thing to go through. But um, this is a slide showing the, num the pressure, first of all, before, it, and this, these are average figures for the last 50 tube operations in our unit and how the pressure comes down and stays down on average and how the number of medications comes down and stays down on average. Of course, there are always exceptions. Um, and the, the next slide shows the same sort of thing that, um, that this is a slightly more technical slide, but it shows that about 60% of tubes are working um, to control the pressure at less than 18, five years after surgery. So it's, it's a big thing to go through, but they do work and are continuing to work. Um, so those were all the questions that I thought, um, or Joanna and I thought might be helpful for, for me to address. Um, so I hope that's useful. And I'll perhaps hand back to you, Joanna, to chair any questions going forward. Yep, of course, very happy to do that. Um, thank you so much for that talk, Phil. It's really interesting and informative. Um, so there, we've had a few questions come in and we had a few questions um, in advance. So um, I'll start with kind of lifestyle bit. So is there anything that a child may, who has glaucoma sort of maybe shouldn't do um, purely because of their glaucoma? And then also if they've had a surgery, are there things that they can't do? Yeah, well, um, in terms of shouldn't do, um, they, that over, there are a few things that um, I've come across recently where, whereby families resort to herbal remedies. Um, and so things like ginseng, garlic, um, and um, they, they actually quite often have a, a noticeable anticoagulant effect, so they make you bleed more. Um, so it's important to know about that if a child or an adult is going forward with surgery. Um, other things to avoid um, are in common with adults with advanced glaucoma, and they're a fairly short list of things that put the pressure up inside your eye. So um, if you play a wind instrument and put the pressure up in your chest, then that puts the pressure up in your eyes. Um, and not all wind instruments, but certain wind instruments, oboe and bassoon, and um, can, can have more of an effect than a flute, from what I understand. Um, any activity that involves standing on your head for a long period of time. So really big yoga fans um, 
so that's a problem. And um, weightlifting uh, are activities that can all um, put your eye pressure up, but they don't come up very often in a, in a children's glaucoma clinic. Um, it's more often things like um, what um, sort of activities are likely to lead to a knock on your eye. So if you're born with glaucoma or you have glaucoma as a young baby, your eyes get big, as mentioned in the, my talk, and big eyes are a bit more fragile. And um, so if you have a bump on your eye from something like a football, usually most eyes will be able to take that without it causing a problem because it can't get into the eye socket. But um, children who've had glaucoma tend to have slightly more fragile eyes. So I think eye protection generally in, in sport is a bit more important, but it's a, always a balance. And, you know, you want um, kids to live as full a life as possible. Um, so I, I tend to avoid blanket bans on anything and prefer to talk about, you know, a, a, a customized approach for a particular child and, and to talk about the risks. I mean, the really high risk things are the same really high risk things for all of us, like um, unsupervised fireworks and um, air guns and darts and snooker cues. Um, but yeah, um, so I do quite often mention that, particularly for a child who has good vision in one eye and not the other eye. So all of those measures to protect that really precious good eye are mm -hmm. super important. Great. So that's very reassuring, hopefully, to lots of parents. And I suppose the key thing is talk to talk to the doctor, um, you know, about what your child is interested in and how maybe adjustments like eye protection might might be helpful. Yeah. But otherwise, yeah, have a have a full and active childhood. From what you're saying. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Great. Um, so this is quite an um, involved question. So a woman whose daughter developed glaucoma when still a baby. She had a congenital cataract. She had tube surgery at 14 months, um, using drops, attending appointments religiously, but she lost her vision in her left eye. How will this affect her as a teenager or adult? Um, again, what things can she can she or can she not do? We've kind of answered that already, but how how so it's I think that's the question about kind of prognosis, really, isn't it? What what can parents expect for their child, and their vision for the rest of their life? Mm. Um, I can't see the question, but it's in the, that's we... in the chat. So from what we know, the other eyes is fine. Is that right? I think so. Yep. So oh. that, in terms of what you can do in life with good vision in one eye, um, the answer is you can have an incredibly full life in terms of career choices. And um, there, are, there are a small number of um, careers that are off limits. Um, but you can have a driving license and you can do just about anything that you can think of with the exception of heavy goods vehicle license, um, certain aviation licenses, most aviation um, and certain military roles. But um, with good vision in one eye, you, they, they're, they're, you know, there's an awful lot in life that um, is very much on, on the cards. Um, mm. Trying to see the. Yes, you said uh, the other eye is fine. It's in the chat rather than the Q and A. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, great. And in terms of, um, oh, yeah. I, know, I know this is a really oh. tricky one, but in in terms of prognosis, if someone's vision is sort of, how, you know, can you say that a child will retain useful sight? How how should parents have that conversation with their doctor? Well, I, again, I think it's all about asking the doctor about their particular about their child because the answer to that question varies hugely from one type of glaucoma to another um, and what's been happening with the pressure control um, and some very serious and aggressive congenital glaucomas can respond really brilliantly to um, a goniotomy, a, an operation that's been around for a long time and the visual prognosis can be very good um, and it Conversely, there are some cases where, 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 yeah, the things are not so good, and it, it for you know, the, the range is really very wide, and it would be um, terrible, really, to think to be to be under the misapprehension that you're on one end of the spectrum or the other. Um, so I think it's all about asking. Mm -hmm. 
and therefore I'm assuming Google with caution because every child yeah. is different and every situation is different. So don't go reading some, some reading too much into someone else's experience. I think that's absolutely right. Yeah. 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 Okay, great. Thank you. Right. We've lots of questions um, in the chat, in the Q&A, sorry. So are yeah. there any surgical options left after drainage tubes have been put in? Well, the answer is yes. There are almost always options. Um, and the, so if there's one drainage tube put in, then very often you can do things to that one drainage tube to get it working better. And if that hasn't worked, then very often you can put a second drainage tube in. Um, and there is a recent trend to, um, to not exclude going back to angle surgery after tubes. It used to be thought that there was a fairly concrete progression that you would move along, um, for, perhaps from medications to angle surgery, to trabeculectomy, to tube surgery. Um, but increasingly people are using tubes, particularly in Europe and North America, um, earlier, and sometimes that will, for example, allow a cornea to clear and you can go back to doing options that weren't possible earlier because of a cloudy cornea. So there, there are lots of options. Um, there's a surgeon in Washington who's a big fan of removing some tube, a tube that's not working and putting a new tube in the place where the old tube was. So um, there are lots of options. Mm -hmm. So again, it would just be talk, talk to your consultant about what might be, um, what might be, yeah. presumably. Yeah. Okay. That's right. Great. Well, that's very reassuring. Thank you. The next question is, how does optic nerve damage typically present itself in a glaucoma patient? I think, well, because it's, it's all about children, can we, can we talk at all about sort of what, how might a child see that has glaucoma and, mm -hmm. and what a parent might be able to recognise if they, yeah. As well, they as I said earlier, I think one of the things that you can look at it two ways. It's good and it's bad that pressure in children um, can be visible from the outside, not in the nerve, but when the pressure is high, in, particularly in young children, particularly under broadly the age of two, the eyes have the ability to stretch and the, the corneas, the clear bit, more often will be cloudy if the pressure's certainly very high. So there are indirect clues that the, that the environment that the nerve is in is not good for the nerve. Um, you, when um, children come to the clinic, we can very often see the nerve. Um, and I wouldn't consider that a, an assessment has been um, complete to my total satisfaction kind of thing without being able to get some idea what the nerve looks like. Um, and there'll be the occasional appointment where you can't see the nerve um, if, um, a little boy or girl is not up for it that day um, and you might say okay well we were able to see the nerve last month or however long ago and that's okay because everything else is looking okay but usually we can get a look at the nerve and just occasionally um, if if we're worried about it then that will in itself will be a reason to have a look under anaesthetic to make sure the nerve looks okay okay great thank you um, so the next question, um, a couple of comments about the passport. So yeah. is that available to other people? Can they get a hold of the glaucoma passport? Right. Well, um, I should say that I don't have any commercial interest in the passport. Um, it sounded a bit like I'm pushing it, but um, the, there's a website. Um, the publisher is called Resonance Publishing, um, and they can be purchased through the website. Um, in my service, we bought them actually with what was IGA support to buy them, and we have a great big box of them, and we hand them out. And um, we're sort of hoping that they're taken up more broadly. Um, but yes, they're they're available. Great. Would you be able to send me the link for that, and then um, if yeah. you're interested, um, we can let people know. Um, we've had yeah. a comment as well from um, somebody who works for a sight loss society saying in that um, in that passport. Do you refer to local blind societies um, within it? And do you, yeah, so do you, do you sort of encourage parents to engage with blind societies? Yeah, we do. But, uh, and again, um, I think the activity of different societies is different in different parts of the country. Um, so the RNIB is referenced in that passport, um, but there, there are other agencies depending on whereabouts in the country you are. Um, so that, that, that are not referenced in that 
document, uh, which was primarily aimed um, at the sort of nationwide uh, suitability. Okay, great, thank you. So talking about sort of resources for children, we have a question about, do, do we have any resources or advice on how to explain glaucoma and the degeneration of sight to children? My son is 10 and while I don't want to scare him, I do want to prepare him. So where might people go for resources? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and I think people like Eclos in Clinic are a good source of advice. Uh, charities are a really good source of advice. Um, I sometimes put families in contact with other families who've been through the journey and are a little bit further along um, and can speak from experience. Um, there, um, again, I might be able to dig it out after we finished, um, but uh, Professor Pencor in at Moorfields uh, was was doing a little cartoon book when I was training with him about ten years ago, uh, which was quite a good good thing, particularly for a ten year old. Um, and it's a good uh, so I'll see if I can dig that out for you to share. Is that okay, Joanna? After, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. That sounds good. Because um, we, yeah, as Glaucoma well, UK, I don't think we we actually have a huge amount to offer. Um, for children, we have a booklet for adults, um, for sort of parents, um, which is available on our website. So right. if you want to sort of read a bit more about it, um, people can order that um, or download it for free. I also know um, that we have someone here from a guide dogs who is quite involved in um, childhood glaucoma. So guide dogs have a, a children's section um, and I think they have advice and support there as well. Um, mm. So perhaps, um, if the person from Guide Dogs is happy with this, if you'd let me know, um, the person who asked the question, I could maybe put you in touch um, to get a bit more support as well, because I know, um, yeah, Guide Dogs have a, have a division for children. Um, so a question about the genetics, you've talked a bit about it, and mm. um, so how, why might glaucoma appear in a child if both parents have tested negative for the gene? So can you talk about the sort of why the genetics bit might pop up? Mm. Well, um, because, I mean, there are lots of reasons. We're getting better and better at finding the gene um, that causes glaucoma or the genes. That's the problem. It's not one gene. Um, so once once you know, once medical science has identified uh, which genes to look for and which genes are associated with a condition, it's much easier to look for those in a particular person. Um, and that area is moving forward all the time. In fact, there, you know, there, there, there's very likely to be, for those parents of um, children with glaucoma who are on the call, um, you may well be approached at some point about willingness to participate in research activity to increase the number of genes that we can identify. Um, so the hit rate is somewhere around 40, 50%, I think, in terms of identifying um, genes to cause glaucoma. So unfortunately, um, the experience of the, the person asking the question is, is much more common than I would like. And it's not unusual for us to, to not be able to identify it. Mm -hmm. uh, and we'd like to make it less. Yeah, yeah, because my, well, my understanding of it is that, you know, there might be sort of 50 genes that are all contributing towards it. And so one parent might have, have, have sort of 25 of those genes and another parent has another 25 of those genes that might make the trabecular meshwork, you know, the drainage a bit harder or the production fluid a bit more or, you know, and they kind mm. of all, all add up. Is that is that right? And so, yeah, so the, the parents might sort of slip under the threshold but those combination of genes come together in the child. And yeah, I think that model is right. Um, uh, but also the, the model applies. Where, so in other words, it can work a bit like heights, if you like. So if you've got two tall parents, you're more likely to have a tall child. Mm -hmm. uh, and glaucoma risk can work in some respects a bit like that for some genes. But there are other genes whereby if you've got two um, mutations of the same gene, just that very specific one will mean that you have a very particular pattern of glaucoma. Okay. Um, and there are some um, rare or slightly rare ones where you only need one copy uh, of your two chromosomes. If you've got that one copy, then there's, you, you, you get glaucoma too. So 
um, there's a whole different, it's complicated and yeah. increasingly um, geneticists are a kind of cornerstone of so many different parts of childhood disease, including glaucoma. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so the next question is about um, the transition from paediatric to adult care. So it must be very sort of worrying both for the, the parents and the children to sort of move from this, this world of paediatrics to adulthood. So yeah. how does, the, the, the person has asked how does the NHS manage the transition, but I think sort of individual doctors and, and parents might. Yeah, I mean, it's a really good question. And um, I think it's something we, again, varies from one locality to another. Um, I mean, what we do in the West Midlands is that we hold a, a joint clinic. Um, I predominantly, well, I only look after children. 99% um, of what I do is children. Um, and my colleague who looks after adult, mostly adults and some children, and I do a joint clinic together and we'll bring families along to meet both of us. Um, and so, and then families will attend my colleague's clinic um, so there's a sort of rather than it be a sudden event, it's more of a kind of transition process mm. and um, children can get used to or um, they don't really feel like children by the time they get 16. Some of them are taller than me, but they mm. they um, they get used to the idea of a new person. And, and you're quite right. It can be quite a difficult transition. Sometimes the question is alluding to that, that um, the environment is very different to suddenly go from a waiting room where they're the biggest, oldest patient in the waiting room to a waiting room where most of the other patients are 50 years older than them is quite a sudden change um, mm -hmm. so we we sort of do some talking and preparation on that day it's a, a clinic that's not booked very um, busily so that there's plenty of time to talk about that transition um, but they and I think as a yeah so that that's that's quite a nice way of doing it but it varies from, from one part of the world to another. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so again, it's all about asking the consultant um, sort of what might be available by the sounds of it and seeing if yeah. it can be done. Great, I don't think we've yeah, got and I time. Think most of the big... Sorry, go on. Sorry, go on. Um, I was just saying we're uh, running out of time slightly for questions. Oh yes, we um, are. Well, I, just briefly, I was gonna say yeah. that I think all of the big units that operate on children with glaucoma have some kind of pathway for transition into adult mm -hmm. care. But it varies. The London, Manchester, Birmingham, Newcastle approaches will all be a bit different. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Thank you. So, okay, so last few questions. If one child has glaucoma, are their siblings more likely to develop it? Again, it depends on what, what the cause of the glaucoma is um, and um, what the genetic cause is. So, for some, so it's all about the specifics. And I, I know. Um, and I hope that um, we're in a position really soon where we'll be able to, to you, know, virtually, you know, exclude the risk for certain siblings and say, actually, and I, we can do that in certain families already. We can say, no, you haven't got the gene that your brother's got. And mm -hmm. we know that your risk is the same as population average um, and be very reassuring. Um, so that, that can sometimes occur, but um, it's often, I think the, the, in the absence of a certainty, it's always about vigilance. And um, as soon as children, siblings are old enough to attend a high street optician, a good high street optician um, can do the screening to make sure the glaucoma doesn't develop going forward. Great, hopefully that's reassuring for people. And last question, um, how do you measure visual fields in young children, given it's so hard to measure it in adults? Big yeah. Well, uh, it, when kids are really young, it's a case of playing with them and holding, getting them to look at me and bringing a toy around here and a toy around here and getting a bit of a, it's really a feel thing. Um, and it takes a while before, um, for those adults who've done a visual field test on the call, they'll know that it, it takes quite a bit of concentration to do it. Um, so that's why you can't, you often can't get a quantified visual field um, until children are six or seven. But again, technology is coming on all the time. So there are apps and um, sort of screen-based devices that are not yet the cornerstone. They're not well sort of um, calibrated against the more um, um, established visual field techniques. But it's a, again, watch the space kind of thing. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Okay, so very different to, to sort of sitting with your head in the bowl like like adults have to do. <laughs> yeah, great. Yeah. Right. Well, I think we've run out of time. Um, I want to make sure we finish uh, nice and on time. So thank you so much, Joe. That was a really interesting talk. Um, hopefully, um, everyone here has got a lot out of it. Um, the person who asked about um, resources and support for children, um, please send me an email and I'll be able to give you the contact details um, for people at Guide Dogs. Um, just want to talk through a couple of things quickly before we um, before we finish. So, as you'll have seen from my um, uh, from my background, it is Glaucoma Awareness Week this week, so a big week for us at Glaucoma UK. Um, it's all about families um, and and glaucoma for us this week. So it's about the sort of family linked with glaucoma. So if you have glaucoma, your family is at around a four or your close relatives, sorry, a four times increased risk of developing glaucoma for normal, normal sort of adult glaucomas rather than childhood ones in particular. Joe's talked about the link to the childhood one. Um, but it's also about how family can look after people with glaucoma. So we've got lots of resources available on our website to help promote Glaucoma Awareness Week. We'd really appreciate your support in um, joining in with that. I'm going to launch our second poll now um, so we can learn a little bit more about how much you've learned during this session. So if you could take a minute or two to um, answer that question, we'd really appreciate it. And finally, I'm aware we haven't answered everyone's questions, so I'm really sorry about that. We ran out of time. Um, if you have any remaining questions, please get in touch with our helpline. I'm very happy to help. Um, the contact details are available on the slide there. Um, so they're open Monday to Friday, 9.30 to 5, or you can email them. Um, very happy to talk through any, any other concerns that you have. Um, our next digital support group, we're taking a bit of a break for the summer, um, but we'll come back on the 31st of August, right at the tail end of summer, with a talk from our CEO, Karen, um, a general talk about all about glaucoma and glaucoma UK, and what we're trying to do, with our mission to prevent glaucoma sight loss. So you can book all of our support groups um, via our website or via our helpline. Um, thank you again to our speaker, Joe for a really fascinating and very helpful talk. Um, when this uh, support group ends, there will be a survey which will launch and um, we'd be really grateful if you could take just a couple of minutes to fill that in so we can make sure we're learning as much as possible about um, about how much you've got out of these sessions. So thank you so much for joining. Good evening everyone and hopefully see you at future talks. Thanks.